just do it. It's, it's, that's, it's literally that simple to me because I think that there is never a perfect moment to try. So I think that, you know, of course we all have like certain, you know, if you, if you have like zero income, no saving, okay, maybe you need to have some sort of safety net in place before you can take the, you know, take that leap of faith. But uh, otherwise, you know, I, I think that's just, just do it. Hey everyone, this is Devin Miller here with another episode of The Inventive Journey. I am your host, Devin Miller, the uh, serial entrepreneur that's also a patent and trademark attorney that helps startups and small businesses. And uh, today we have a, another great journey to share with Hugo. And uh, first of all, I like the name Hugo, so that's a, it gives you an A+, an a plus already. And then from there, um, Hugo started his career as kind of a um, software um, engineer and developer, and he did that for a period of time. Um, Worked for a little while, got an MBA, came back and decided he was going to uh, go out and do his, uh, enter into the life of uh, startups and and entrepreneurship while doing kind of online gaming to combat misinformation. So that's the two second overview of what you do, but welcome onto the podcast, Hugo. Thank you very much. Uh, Glad to be here. And uh, yeah, thank you for this intro. I think I was spot on. All right. So I did the very quick intro and probably massacred it. So maybe you want to go through and tell everybody a bit more about your journey and what you're doing and or what, what brought you up to today. Absolutely. Yeah. But uh, I guess you covered the, the main pieces very well. I started my career as a software engineer after studying uh, back home in uh, Montreal, Canada. So for the listeners who are wondering what this accent is from, well, now you know, I'm from Quebec. So it's a French Canadian accent. <laughs> And uh, yeah, so I, uh, I worked in Montreal for a few years, then moved to the Bay Area, and that's when I did this. So I'm going to jump in, because so you, five years is a, a long enough period of time. So what did you do for those five years as kind of the oh. software engineer and developer? Sure, sure. Yeah, I was working in the uh, public transit space for a company called Giro. Uh, so it was quite interesting because I got to do the programming side, but also I got to go meet clients, got a requirements, do some training. So I got to go to Oslo in Norway, Boston, Chicago. Uh, because basically my team was in charge of customizing the software for each individual city because you know you can imagine in the public transit space it's like like these are like big behemoth of companies right that have so many different rules to put in place so uh, and actually that's when I realized that I love the software part of it but I also really like everything else that was related to it so that's why during these five years I kind of transitioned like doing less and less programming and more and more of pretty much everything else that goes around the actual programming itself um, okay. which was actually a great segue to then become a product manager when I moved to the Bay Area. Mm. So um, that, that, that's how I basically ended up doing that switch. And, and I was very fortunate because I ran into a recruiter uh, here in Oakland, California, where I'm based now. And uh, he's the one, um, when I spoke to him, uh, you know, during the interview process for an engineering job at the time, he's the one who realized that, hey, you know what? We have this job called product manager that you might be interested in. And I didn't even know what it was at the time. So it was a great fit. I feel very lucky that I ran into him, uh, given that, you know, I think these five years of experience as an engineer, that was just a, a very natural segue into the product management space. Okay. No, and I think that that makes good sense. So started out as an engineer, kind of found out project manager fits your personality, fits your situation, and also had the opportunity to do, was that, was a project, because you also did the MBA, right? So it was a project yeah, so manager. That is, uh, that is more recent, yeah. So, uh, yeah, and when you say project manager, there's actually like a, like a slight difference between project and product management. Um, um, because th- basically the way I always explain it is that the engineers are in charge of figuring out the how we're going to do something. Mm-hmm. The project managers are more about the when, you know, how, how we're going to exec- actually execute it in terms of timeline. And the product managers are more in charge of the what. So, so it's like the, the when, the what, and the how. Like these, this trio of people in software development all work together to make things happen. And I, I've always, you know, liked the product side the most because I think this is the one that has a little bit more, you know, we need to wear so many different hats basically because we need to be the glue between all these different people. We get to make decisions. We get to bring new ideas to the table. So that's what's really fascinating about it. And you mentioned the MBA. That's, that's also a very uh, natural, you know, set of tools to add for a product manager because we also need to think about the business side of, uh, of the firm that we're working for. So it was just a very natural transition. And it was super interesting. I decided to do that part-time. So I went for three years at UC Berkeley. Uh, So it was a bit uh, intensive, to to say the least, working full-time and going to school two, three times a week. 
Uh, but that was great. I learned so much, met so many different people. And um, this is really when I figured out that, you know, I think I would like to be an entrepreneur at some point um, because I could see that, you know, driving a business is what I find super interesting. And uh, I actually work on a few different projects, which kind of led me towards the one that I decided to focus on since last fall. So that was a nice transition. So, if, so if I were to summarize, I started out as just, not just, but as a, a software programmer engineer, then you got, got put more into the product management, instead right. of project, product management. And then uh, you did that for a period of time, kind of found that you love to do more of the entrepreneur business side, you know, still, and I, and I get that in the sense, that, you know, people often ask, you know, kind of, if I was, because I did electrical engineering as an undergraduate, and they say, you know, and now I'm an attorney, and, but I also like to do the business side, which is why I'd say I'm a serial entrepreneur. But if I were to take all that, you know, at least as, especially on the folks of engineering, they say, well, how did you make the transition from engineer to attorney, right? Or a lawyer, right. so, you know, most people don't necessarily think those are commonality. And I said, well, I got to the end of engineering school. You said I didn't want to be an engineer, but I liked engineering. And so then I could go and be a patent attorney and work with all the cool, all the engineers, lots of technology, lots of what they're doing. And so that kind of gives me the good balance if I can get out still work on a lot of engineering and also get the diversity. So a little bit of kindred spirits there, but didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, yeah. so, so you did that. Oh, no, yeah, no, I get it. Yeah. And I, in my MBA, there were actually quite a few engineers who were just like you trying to do the transition to maybe, you know, to go into law, to go into consulting or business. I mean, of course, law was not the most common <laughs> in the MBA program, but it's exactly the same principle. Yeah. Yeah. So you did that and you decide, okay, I want to be more on the, product management. Now I want to do my, you know, build on top of that, do my own thing. So you yep. went to the MBA school and kudos to you. I said, I, again, kindred spirits. I worked, you know, I did dual degrees. So I did a law degree and an MBA degree at the same time. And then I was also working part-time in a law firm. And so I get that that's a, you, you a arduous. <laughs> I've been through that. I get where you're at and I, yep. I certainly feel for you because it's a, it can make for a tough juggle. Um, but made it, made it through the MBA program. You decide you want to start your own business, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, actually, I was thinking that maybe to explain why I picked that business, I was um, going to tell you a little bit of a story. And uh, it's actually something that I used during my MBA program for one of the classes that we had. Uh, you know, I had some communication classes, innovation, design. And the story was basically about like, why do I care about facts? Because you, you explain, right? Like, the, the, you know, you just give like this two second summary of how I'm trying to basically improve fact checking with gamification. But taking a step back, you know, why would I care so much about facts? And and I think that, like, that to me, there is like one very good example. And it, I try to keep it short, but it's a, a story that starts a thousand years ago in the past. Mm -hmm. And the story is about how back then people noticed that there was a bright new star that showed up in the sky. And that star was so bright that they could see it during the day. And then mm -hmm. after maybe a couple of weeks, it started to fade away. People were very puzzled by that. They didn't really know what happened back then. Now, fast forward to today. If you take the Hubble Space Telescope and look at that exact same patch of sky, well, what we see now is actually what I got tattooed on my shoulder. And for people who are just on the audio, this is actually an image of the Crab Nebula. This is uh, this picture, like I said, that Hubble took. And mm -hmm. this is the leftover of a supernova explosion. This is a star, a very massive star that at the end of its life exploded and now created this leftover, like this cloud that's going away with all the different elements into it. Mm. And the reason why I care so much about that is that, well, first, I just think this is fascinating that we are able to like, look at these things. You know, we have such advanced instruments and it's a bit unfortunate that I feel like, you know, it's not the kind of things that we learn so much in school and whatnot. And people get a little bit, I don't know, uninterested. But mm. there is actually so much more to it because these stars that explode, they are the only way where some, um, some of the heavier elements in our bodies, in our planet are formed. So basically, you know, like the, the iron that's in our teeth, the calcium, uh, sorry, iron that's in our blood, the calcium that's in our teeth and our bone, all of the carbon in us, the oxygen in our lungs, all of that come from stars that exploded. And so basically, like to me, this is truly really like one of the most astonishing facts that we can know about the universe because it, it touches astronomy, physics, chemistry, biology. Yet today, we, you know, even with the internet and everything we can learn about, we still hear things like the earth might be flat. Maybe we did not really go to the moon. You know, like, and I don't want to get started into all of these different <laughs> conspiracy theories, right. but you see what I mean, right? Like to me, this is like so fascinating and, and sad, frankly, how we can know so much. We can have so much knowledge about so many different things and how the universe works, 
yet it seems that it's not making that much progress. So that, you know, this is just one example, of course, there would be tons of them, but that's one of the reasons why I figured that, you know what, like this is what I really care about. Like I've been like an, a geek all my life reading science magazines and whatnot. And I think if I can truly really make an impact, that's going to be in that space because I, I wish that we could spread more information like this and try to fight misinformation in return because we shouldn't have to constantly pull the same things over and over again, right? Mm -hmm. Like this example of the earth being flat. I mean, this is a bit of a silly one because I, I still find it hard to believe that there are people who really believe it. Like, you know, like they might be trolling or maybe they just want to get attention, but there's still like some skepticism, right? <laughs> Where they, some people might think that, yeah, the earth is really flat. So I, I, I'm just trying to figure out, like, you know, is, is there a better way that we can spread information and make it very, very reliable so that we don't need to always go back and prove the same things over and over again. And then yeah. of course, ultimately, that should also apply to our day-to-day -day lives, right? Because then that becomes even more complicated, right? You have, you have some news article that comes up about some whatever topic, right? It doesn't even really matter. The point is that like the news cycle is so quick and just so fast that it's hard to figure out, okay, but what is actually true within these pieces of news that we hear left and right? And, you know, and people end up being like these silos of information, as we know, like social media has made it even more difficult to kind of break these walls and try to get more different point of views on certain topics. So, but, but at the end of the day, even if we have different, a difference of opinion we should always have the same facts at hand and that that's why you know i really care about this i want to try to find ways to make it better and make it more fun also because it, it can become a little bit dry right like it's a it's a little bit tedious to not everybody has the time to go online and try to figure out oh is my source of information truly correct or not you know am i am i being lied to am i being biased without realizing it but again all of that comes back to the idea that if we have the facts at you know at its core then these facts are going to help us build proper opinions and also be a little bit more aware when we hear something that doesn't sound quite right, you know, to kind of develop that intuition that, well, wait a minute, you know, I've, I have did the research on that topic and I, I know that cer certain things that are absolutely correct. So if I hear some piece of news that contradicts some of these elements, well, I know right away that there's something up, right? So if I were to dive in and say, so, because we've kind of almost jumped over and for the, the listeners, what does, you know, gamification, because we talked kind of about gamification, about misinformation, and that's kind of where you wanted to put Absolutely. your startup, both spread good information and also for misinformation or information that's only partially true or factually not true or whatnot, be able to correct that or to provide, you know, a source of better truth. And so, so what, you know, maybe if you were to give, what is the, how do you go about making a business around that, right? One thing is, is, you know, the importance of information and you know, importance of being able to share correct information. But how do you, as I said, how do you build a business around that or make that into a business? Absolutely, yeah, this is a big challenge, obviously. And so I think there are tons of different ways of doing it. The way that I'm trying to approach it right now is um, th there's quite a lot of different angles, but like I mentioned, the idea is to build a game around it. So that's the first pillar. And the gamification aspect of it is that I want to have as many people as possible come in and make it fun for them to try to figure out, figure out what is true or not. But obviously like, okay, but how are we going to make that happen, right? Because if it's just like a bunch of people trying to figure it out, that's not necessarily going to be great. So that's why the second pillar of the game is also a training tool, because I want to make sure oh, yeah. that there's a process in place. Sorry, just to dive in. So making, yeah, sure. how do you make that into a game? Like, you know, that's probably the still qu first question. I mean, I get online video games, I go on and although I'm not a big gamer, you know, I used to play like when I was a kid, Mario Kart or yeah, you know, yeah. Luigi and Mario and Super Mario and those type of things. Or I remember Duck Hunt, some of those, which, that, you know, dates me a bit. Um, but, you know, I get those games, but how do you make misinformation a game or finding the truth of information? How do you make that into a game, you know, that people are going to want to engage with? Or what's right. the well, of that game? Well, well, first of all, I, I need to, you know, be humble and, you know, admit that I've not figured it out, out completely yet. It's still very new. But some of the, the, the main principles basically is that first I want to start with something about like sorting. So that's, a, that's just one small example. But the idea is that you, you're shown some statements, for example, and you need to quickly decide, okay, is that statement a statement of fact or is it a statement of opinion, for example? So then, you know, people can just play the game at first, just, you know, just to kind of quickly try to sort as many statements as possible first. So that's just a way for them to kind of train themselves. And, but because it's a game, you know, the idea is that there is a timer, they can get some points, they get some badges, rewards as they progress through the game. And mm -hmm. then the idea is that they can actually level up and not be given some responsibilities. 
because there's another aspect of the game where it's also people submitting statements. They, they, basically, the, the users are going to create some of the content. It's not just going to be me, you know, just sending them content. The idea is that eventually, I want to have people crowdsource all of that information that comes in. So then the individuals are going to be able to submit statements and then have other people with maybe like some sort of higher up level be able to verify their statements. And then as we progress, because you know, at first it's very simple, like I gave this example just now, you just sort between something which is objective or subjective, but mm -hmm. then you can start to add more complexity on top of it. Uh, like the feature I'm developing right now, I call them quests. So the idea is that players will be able to, to form some sort of league, then they can start and go on a quest to try to figure out what is true. But again, I don't want it to be completely free for all because then there's no point. And you can just have like some sort of blog and people just talk about stuff. I want to make it more organized. So break it down into days, for instance, where, okay, at first we want to make sure that the problem is very well defined. You know, what are we trying to answer? Is it even something that can be answered in the first place or not? So then the players can exchange ideas and try to figure out, okay, yeah, what should be the statement that we worked on? And again, because it's a game, it always goes back to the idea that, you know, they should get rewarded for what they're doing. And the people who are the best performer will, will get, you know, a little badge of honor, they might, you know, Everybody likes to see their name at the top of the leaderboard, right? At the very least. And if I were to just build that, just having some sort of point system where the people who contribute the most are seen as the ones who have been the best players for that day, that week, whatever, then, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that this is going to encourage people to want to participate and be good citizen as part of that game. So if I were to, um, almost, if I were to try and break down to my level, and if I'm putting words in your mouth, certainly stop me. I'd almost sorry. look at this as a Wikipedia gamified, right? In the sense, because you almost have Wikipedia. And if I, my understanding of Wikipedia, which is limited, mm -hmm. is you'll have people write a Wikipedia article, right? On whatever right. topic they find interesting, whether it's about, you know, the stars and the explosions or whether it's about, my, you know, microbacteria, or whether it's about whatever, yeah. about the economy or about, you know, whatever the topic may be. But then you'll have people that they're on Wikipedia and generally they, they don't, they aren't paid, but they go out and they do it out of the, you know, kindness of their heart, so to speak then they're going to have people to fact check because you get people like the fact check, see if it's true, almost has to be submitted. And almost in that kind of same sense, you're going to have people that you're going to have topics or facts or things that people would then gamify. They would actually kind of go out, be sluice or to, in order to show that they understand or know the information, they would be the sluice that then would figure these things out in a game type setting. And that's where you'd start to arbitrate the truth. Is that kind Absolutely. of the right way? Yeah, you're doing a great job at, the, at summarizing it all. That's great. So you do that. So now you're saying, okay, I've got a, the, the constructs. We've got the idea. We're going to build a game around it. We're going to try and make it both fun, interesting, make it competitive. So people are going to want to earn the badges. There, maybe you, you know, fold in advertising. You don't fold in advertising, but you kind of do those different things. So how do you then, you know, and you, you, I, you're still along figuring out the process, but how do you start to build a company, you know, how do you identify because you got you know that's a, a fairly large challenge to tackle on mm -hmm. misinformation and that so kind of how did you or, or are in the process of building a company around that oh yeah that's a, that's that's the tougher part i guess of the equation because to build a company and to really scale it that's going to be quite challenging because right now i mean i just started that like full time a couple of months ago so i really need to figure that out but the way i see it it's uh it's it, in a sense, it's just like any other software company, at least, at, you know, at, like the most boring part of it, if I can put it this way, because it's really all about building this platform, making it as easy as possible for users, building more of these mini games, I call them. So mm -hmm. that's just to create engagement. And so all of that framework, the way I see it, there's nothing that different from any other software company. So that's why it's both easy and complicated at the same time, in the sense that, you know, the, the easy part is that... I, I've done it. I've worked at many software companies. I know that I need a bunch of engineers. I need the UX researchers, the designers, the product managers, the project managers, all of these people to work together to build a great product, a great platform that then grows into a company. But of course, the complicated part is that, okay, but what are they going to build exactly? And then that goes back to all, you know, all of these other questions that we asked so far, where that's on me to figure that out, to really try to make sure that I drive this process in the right direction. I have a solid roadmap of features that I want to add and really make an impact and make sure that we're building the right thing. Because, you know, we all have like so many resources that we can spend. And, you know, right now it's mostly my time. But eventually, as I build this company, I need to make sure that we focus on the right things and really build something that can make an impact and, and also be pretty quick, right? Because we know that things change, you know, it could be replaced by something else. So I need to be cognizant of that. And that's why I'm also thinking about, okay, what can I do that's really different? Because 
I, I don't want to be just a, another Wikipedia that's fun, right? It, I think it should be a little bit more than that. If I want it to be a successful company that can generate revenue and hire people, well, it needs to be something big and significant, which is, which is what's different maybe from Wikipedia because they, they have, you know, they had such a great mission, but it's, it's a nonprofit, right? It's, it's about, you know, people coming together and building this encyclopedia, which is great, but it's not necessarily something that people go to, to, um, you know, to entertain themselves and maybe a little bit, but you know, it's not something that people would spend a lot of time on. So I, I still need to figure that out because as a business, I want to have users come back and really be engaged with the platform. And that's going to be, you know, what's going to really drive the business forward to have all these users that are engaged with the platform. And so, but I still need to figure that out. So that's going to be interesting to, uh, you know, interesting challenges to face. And just, and just a, an aside or a harebrained thought, because I mean, this is a misinformation is where a lot of platforms are having to deal with, right? And not yeah. getting into the political field as far as taking one side or the other, but you have, you know, Twitter and Facebook and other platforms, social media, they're trying to figure out how do we, what role do we play? Do we, do we try and figure out what is in misinformation? Do we leave it up to the individuals? And you have, you know, different companies that have taken different tacks, right? Some yeah. of them said, we're just going to, we're just a platform. We're not going to figure anything out. Others are saying, no, we're going to figure out what's in for misinformation or potentially misinformation. And we're going to let our, you know, people on our platform know that. And so would you, you know, would it ever line up or make sense that you're almost your, cause, and for those that have taken the tact that we're going to try and figure out what's in misinformation, would you ever then apply this kind of almost that theory or gamification so that you're getting a larger people or people that are wanting to do game, you know, via a game or via some incentive system help to check out a lot of those and get a better engagement there. Yeah, so exactly. I, and, I, and I think the way I see it is that, 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 that's why I mentioned that the most basic features of the game are just sorting because it sounds silly, it sounds very simple, but I think that like to me, this is one of the big problems that we see with the platforms that exist today. Whether they try to label certain statements as misinformation or not, like whether they try it to try to do it or not, at the end of the day, the, the big problem is that it's never really clear whether is it is it something that an opinion that we see as bad or dangerous or really good, or is it a statement of fact that is actually wrong? And 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 that's what I find a bit un unfortunate because you can spend all day labeling different, you know, labeling a tweet by someone about, you know, oh, is it accurate or not? But like, like to me, that's all, like, it's already kind of like skipping a few steps because we should always ask ourselves, okay, but wait, was the person just sharing their opinion or were they actually trying to make a statement about something that is true or not, right? Mm. And, and that's where I think that by you know, making it very, very small at first, having these small basic building blocks of truth, I think that's going to really make a difference. And, and I think that's what's really novel with my approach because I mean, the gamification part is kind of a way to engage people. But like, you know, under the hood, I think that's where the real strength is because I'm trying to find a better way to organize statements by sorting them properly and really building a, a new type of language, essentially. You know, I, I call it like the truth language. Um, I mean, we'll see the name might change, like the exact implementation might change. But my idea is that I want to find ways where the statements can be really codified very well in software so that we can then build this tree of knowledge with all of the different statements linked to each other but more importantly to really figure out okay but is it a statement of fact in the first place or not mm. you know like a, because i you know personally i'm all for like you know complete open free speech like people should be able to say whatever they want but the second this is something that we can label as true or false well even if they didn't mean it that way well it doesn't matter it's like okay yeah you, you said that one thing that may, maybe you thought it was your opinion but that statement is actually something that we can verify as being true or not so let's figure that out and, and it can be the other way around too, because I've seen sometimes, you know, people voice an opinion and then, you know, you have uh, some sort of mob like all up in the air, you know, like, oh my God, I can't believe they said that. It's like, okay, sure. Like maybe I agree or disagree with them. But the point is that, was it really something factual? Because mm -hmm. if it's not, I mean, I don't care. You know, <laughs> if, if someone just, it's like, okay, the, the opinion might sound horrible, but that, that's okay, it's their opinion. I mean, if it's a politician, well, just don't vote for them. <laughs> no, but I think that you, you do point out a good thing that I think oftentimes people tend to overlook, which is, you know, there is a difference between trying to make a, a statement of fact, you know, sky is blue. I'm going to, I'm right. saying that as a, a, a definitive statement of fact versus, you know, I think, and I'll pick them, 
Miley Cyrus, and I really don't listen to Miley Cyrus. Miley Cyrus is the best singer ever, right? One is I'm saying a statement of fact. The other one's my opinion. Even though I'm not a Miley, Miley Cyrus, I was the first one that happened to pop in my head for whatever reason. <laughs> Um, so you do that, and, you, and I think you're right in the sense that, you know, some of these are opinions, and you just say, this is my opinion, they're my thoughts on the issue, and they're much different than I'm trying to make a statement of fact that people are either, you know, either I'm trying to mis or misinform people to guide them towards my thought, or I'm just trying to make a statement of fact to say, hey, here are the kind of almost, now I look at it, and if I'm an attorney, I'd like to argue or debate, you know, just as for a matter of fun, and my wife, it drives her nuts, but, you know, there's a difference. You're trying to set the meters of what you're the construct within what your discussion, right? So if you're saying the facts are, you know, this happened and this happened, you know, if I were to take it in the legal sphere, you know, this person committed X, Y, and Z actions, are they guilty of a crime or not guilty of the crime? Right. Saying, okay, if we can at least agree on, you know, steps one, two, and three that they did, then we can then decide, okay, does that mean that they are, should be guilty or not be guilty? And then there's a much different conversation versus, hey, it's my opinion that this person's a great person or not a great person. So, so yeah, now that we've, now, you know, that's a, a fun aside and we'll, we'll put it there as a side. So with all of that, everything in mind, next, uh, you know, I think that we mentioned, we talked a little bit, you kind of got a rough prototype working, you're building right now, you're looking to roll that out in Q3 or Q4. So how does that, when, when can people expect to start to see something, they can check it out, they can get more information and how do, how do they get involved on that side? Oh yeah, that's a good question. Uh, actually, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure I'm comfortable sharing some sort of public timeline yet. I'm, I'm not quite there at that point, but uh, people can definitely reach out if they want to be some prototype testers. Uh, I have a very easy email address to remember, uh, if, you, if you don't mind just sharing it with your okay. listeners. So it's my name, Hugo at W-O-F dot L-L-C. It's that simple because it's the, I'm calling the game the world of facts. So I created my L-L-C, W-O-F. So it's that easy. Hugo at wolf.llc if you want to say it uh, as a word. I realized after paying the acronym, it's like it sounds a bit like a dog, like a wolf, but it's just, just one O, W-O-F. Yeah, so no, I'm looking. I mean, right now it's still, uh, it, it's still closed, you know, in the sense that, uh, you know, I want to make sure that I, I polish it a little bit more before really advertising it. So that's why there is not like a, any, uh, there's not like a, a website where people can just go and try it themselves. You know, they, they need to contact me and I just give the link one by one because I, I want to make sure that I test it properly before releasing it. But I'm, I, I'm getting close to the point where I was, uh, you know, I'm hoping that to maybe create a community, some sort of blog or forum where people might come and contribute and share ideas and also try the prototype. Um, but, you know, I mentioned this quest uh, idea that I'm working on. So um, I, I think that might be like the, the one big, building block that I need to finish before I can release that. Because to me, like the, the, the quest is super important because that's what's going to be the, basically one of the ways to prove that it works, you know? And, and that's why I might need to fine tune it. Maybe it's not going to work right away. But the idea is that the, the goal of a quest is that the players come up with some new statement that they can really, you know, that they can really put like their, there's a seal of approval on saying that, yeah, you know what? We did all the work, this is true. So once I get to that stage where I have like that part of the game that works very well and we can see value out of it, I think that's when I'll be able to open it up more to other people and, you know, and have more people join, produce content, have more moderators, verificators, people just think for fun, maybe just people reading information that they find interesting, all that kind of like these different kind of users that could join and look at the system. Well, I need to make sure that it's all set up properly before I release it. Okay. No, I think, and we jumped ahead in this, or jump, usually I do my two questions before I, we, we talk about how to get in contact with it, but I thought it felt, or kind of uh, fell in right now is, hey, because uh, you, you're right now, prototype stage, building it up, getting it going, and wanting to, you know, figure it out, get those beta testers, having gone through software and, and other companies and that, you know, those testers can be very beneficial from everything, right. providing feedback to understanding what works and what doesn't work or where things are going to break or what people won't understand. So I thought, you know, I'd certainly give a little bit of a plug for if people are wanting sure. to get engaged <laughs> and involved. So as we kind of hit towards the end of the podcast, um, I always ask my two questions. So I'll ask them now. And, you know, you, you just got started on this latest startup, but we can certainly take the, you know, within the whole realm of, of doing work and business and that, what was the worst business decision you ever made? Yeah, I was uh, I was thinking about that because you know you you told me this question would be coming, <laughs> and the uh, it's a, it's it's tricky to answer because thankfully I don't think I ever made like I mean we all make mistakes but I didn't make like a very big business decision that I really regret. But um, I was thinking about how like not starting this project sooner I think might be my biggest mistake. 
Um, because, you know, I, I really love the last two jobs that I had at uh, Zendesk and Zap Labs. I worked for one year at each company. It was great. Like, I met a lot of people that were really nice. And then the, the businesses were doing great. But for me personally, like, I didn't grow that much within these roles. Mm. So, and all that to eventually get to the point where I decided to, you know, leave Zendesk and start my own company. So then, you know, looking back, I'm, and especially because, you know, basically two years and a half ago, that's when I started to think about this idea. You know, that's why I mentioned that I did a presentation during my MBA where I literally discussed that project. I mean, not, I didn't know that I was going to do a game at the time, but I had this idea at the back of my mind. You know, I wanted to work on that project. That's something I've been so passionate about. So going and, you know, spending two times one year at, you know, two different companies that, again, they're great, but that was not really what I wanted to do. So I feel like I'm, you know, I, I, I can only imagine what I would be. So I, if I had already worked for two years on that and especially during the MBA, you know, I could have, because I had the classes already anyway, so it would have been a little bit more flexible and it was quite tricky to do work full time and school. So maybe it would have been a little bit easier to start that. But anyway, it's still, I still learn a few things at these companies. Right. It was not a terrible decision, but that's about it. Fair enough. So now I'm going to, I think that, no, I think that's a good, um, that almost kind of bleeds into the second question, but I'll ask the second question anyway, mm -hmm. which is, so if you take the, um, you know, now getting into startups, you know, deciding to finally make that jump, even if it was a bit delayed or, you know, otherwise wanted to move it forward and do it quicker, um, what would be the one piece of advice you'd give to somebody that's wanting to or just starting out with a startup or small business? Right. Yeah. No, uh, I, actually, I was kind of blending the two answers at the same time because, yeah, the, <laughs> because the advice I would give is just do it. It's, it's, that's, it's literally that simple to me because I think that there is never a perfect moment to try. So mm -hmm. I think that, you know, of course, we all have like certain, you know, if you, if you have like zero income, no saving, okay, maybe you need to have some sort of safety net in place before you can take that, you know, take that leap of faith. But uh, otherwise, you know, I, I think that's just, just do it, just start because otherwise we're always going to push it to later, you know, always delaying, delaying. And, uh, and I actually did learn that because I was involved in another project with, uh, so I had a kind of a, I guess I was kind of co-founder for a little while. And then I realized that, you know, that's one thing I learned from this project that things were, you know, we were all, anyway, I, without getting into the details, uh, the point was that it was like, just always a little bit too slow, you know, it's always like, okay, but let, let's just do it, you know, let's just, just get to that next stage, that next step. So that, I think that's the, the best advice I could give. Just do it. So two, uh, the two points of advice, you, or, you know, learn from mistakes is waiting too long. And then on the flip side is just do it. Don't hold off. So. Exactly. That's why I think they, I think they match very well. Yeah. So, well, there's always more things to talk than ever time to talk about in the podcast. And so, um, we reached that point in the podcast, but I appreciate you coming on. I look forward to, you know, seeing how your crusade against misinformation and how you're going to make that fun and interesting and building the platform around that. I think it's a, an interesting and a fun place to take. So with that, uh, appreciate coming on. Um, for those of you that are interested in telling your journey on the inventive journey, um, feel free to apply on the inventive journey.com. Go to there and you can uh, apply to tell your journey. And for those of you that are uh, listeners, make sure to subscribe on any of the platforms to hear all of the new episodes. And lastly, uh, if you need any help with patents or trademarks, feel free to reach out to us at Miller IP Law, and we're happy to help and make sure to get you taken care of. Hugo, thank you again for coming on the podcast. It was fun thank to you hear much. your story and to hear your journey. All right. Thank you very much for your time. Okay. Have a good one. <laughs>